Hello, this is Joel Angel with skatahacker.com with a demonstration video today that's going to show you how we can protect our industrial control systems from zero day attacks. In 2010, many became aware of the vulnerability of control systems with the disclosure of the Stuxnet worm and how it targeted the particular Siemens PCS7 industrial control system. In March of 2011, a security researcher publicly disclosed 34 vulnerabilities covering four different control systems. Today, we're going to take a look in particular at the Siemens factory link system and how we can implement some layers of defense to provide a pretty comprehensive solution around protecting these older legacy control systems from both those known and unknown vulnerabilities that exist today. To do that, we need to understand a little bit about the Siemens PCS7 and the vulnerabilities that were disclosed. The March 21st disclosure included six different vulnerabilities that targeted two particular service or applications running within the factory link control system. One of them targeted the virtual real-time network component or the VRN service, which happens to operate on TCP port 7579. The other service that was the subject of these vulnerabilities was the Windows Client Server Services or CS service. This particular application is not installed and running on the system which I will show you today version 7.5 so we're going to focus in particular on the VRN vulnerabilities. Of the six vulnerabilities disclosed, several of them had to do with buffer overflows or memory corruption. The particular vulnerabilities that I'm going to show you today center around information leakage and how a particular vulnerability can actually extract information from these control systems. One important thing to understand is that the researcher did release publicly proof of concept code. However, he did not actually validate that this particular code could be converted into an actual exploitation allowing remote execution of code. The reason I want to talk about the VRN service is that this happens to be the core service running within FactoryLink that's responsible for communication between clients and servers as well as between servers when we're talking redundancy and various application communication. So the exposure of a vulnerability in this service can be very severe in that it's very hard to protect such a, a key component within the control system as it is used by so many of the overall components that comprise our integrated control system. To do this, we're going to build a little demonstration system today. When we first start off, we're going to look at the insecure implementation, which is going to consist of a factory link server and a single factory link client. And what we're going to do is we're going to look and see how the client communicates with the server using Olay for process control. And then we're also going to add into this architecture a remote node, which is going to launch our attack against that particular server. To begin, let's take a look at our server node here, which is a Windows 2003 server running at IP address 172.16.252.182. This is, contains the factory link server software components as well as some of the um, software used for development features. Now, since we did talk about how OPC was going to be used to communicate between clients and servers, it's very important that at this particular point, we come in and we actually configure uh, some restricted ports that will be used by the callback associated with OPC. Because if we do not do this, OPC would be open to connecting across any range of ports ranging from 10, 000, or 1,025 up to 65,535. So what I've done here is I've narrowed this range down. Per the Siemens recommendations, I should have about 100 ports open. And I've decided to place these in the range of 10,000 to 10,100. It'll make it very easy to see as we look at this later in our demonstration. So this particular feature is done in our DCOM configuration screen within the Windows server that is used to host the factory link server components. I also have a factory link 7.5 client. It's sitting at address .187. 
on this particular component. I do have my remote client only component software installed. And this particular application will be used to connect to the server via OPC and communicate with the server components. So if I call up an active display here, we see that the server is now running and the client's communicated. And then I can actually activate a graphic where we can see dynamic data changing. What's very important at this point is to take a look at the actual services that are running on this particular node and to see what ports are being used to communicate with the server. So if remember the server is at address 182, we can, can see our OPC communication occurring in the 10,000 range. We also see uh, port 135, which as you recall, this is used as the endpoint mapper uh, for OPC to establish the initial communication and then obtain information on the subsequent port 10,000 to 10,100 that will be used for further communication. We also can see some NetBIOS communication going on here on port 139 and there should also be at some point in time some SMB communication that will take place on port 445. So we now have a client server communication that uh, is establishing a data access flow through OPC with our server and is able to obtain data. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move over to our attack server. This particular attack server, as I said earlier, is actually sitting at IP address .128. The Italian security researcher develops some proof of concept code of which we're going to run one particular attack sequence against the vulnerable VRN service. This is a very simple attack which is going to collect the boot.ini file. The service runs on port 7579, and what we're going to do is we're going to feed it a particular crafted data packet. And as you can see, it obtains the boot.ini file from the server. Now, the reason I particularly like this attack is that in the process, it did not uh, cause a denial of service or further crash our server from running. So as we can see, the server is still active. The client is able to maintain data communication. And our attack server is able to do a, an information disclosure. Be sure to join me for part two of this video series where we'll take a look at how we can implement a solution to prevent attacks similar to this.